Well, good evening once again, folks. I'm really happy to be with you again this evening. It's been a, a beautiful, somewhat cool Sunday. It's been wonderful to have the kids playing and, and a couple of their little friends over today playing outside in the snow. And it's just uh, lovely to have the space and see the kids be able to run around in the trees and enjoy a day off. I uh, just wanted to uh, spend a few moments, of course, in God's Word and uh, sharing a few thoughts with you for the day. Uh, but before we do, let's seek the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, uh, I just want to thank you once again. Uh, we can come into your presence, and we are always in your presence, but we can come even more into your presence uh, whenever we get on our knees and we seek you in prayer. We have been told no problem is too great or too small that you will not hear and answer, yet you are the king of the entire universe. May we let that sink in. May we be awestruck, filled with wonder and amazement that the king of the universe cares about the things that we care about. Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your presence and fill us with your spirit this evening and help us to always be aware and always be focused on you so that we are not caught up in the trap, caught up in the traps and snares that the devil lays out for those who would seek to honor and love you. Lord, we ask your Holy Spirit to guide this evening, and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Not too long ago, I uh, ended up kind of impromptu needing to do a children's story in church. The person doing it was not able to be there that Sabbath, and so I asked the Lord really quick what I should do, and this text popped into my head that I'm going to share with you, 1 Peter 5, 8. Uh, but the little story that I shared, and if you were at church that week, you'll remember, was uh, about a way where you catch turtles. Uh, and I remember doing this a couple of times in different places where there was turtles around when we were younger. Uh, but you get a nice little piece of wood and, and uh, that floats on the water, and you tie a little string to it, and you push it out into the water, and then you sit there and you wait. And I'm not really all that patient, but sometimes I could wait long enough for a turtle to climb up and sit on that little piece of wood and start sunning himself and relaxing and thinking all is well and, and really kind of just probably suntanning whatever turtles do when they're sitting relaxing in the sun. Then you could slowly pull that little string in and before you know it, that turtle was within your reach and you could pick it up and you had yourself a turtle until you decided to let it go again. And so I shared that story and then I read this text, the text that we're going to share this evening. And this is what it says. Be sober, be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful if when the devil came, he was like, I'm here to get you on the devil. Uh, and and uh, you ran away scared. Uh, unfortunately, he is much more subtle than that. He's like the little boy sitting on the bank of a of a little stream or or of a little pond with a little string slowly pulling in that very comfortable little piece of wood floating where that turtle is just sitting enjoying his day, relaxed, not concerned about anything until it's too late. Now, the devil works much like that. That roaring lion, that's the attitude he has, but he has learned that he has to have a more subtle approach. And so we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. We need to be watchful. Now I'm going to go back to another letter written by Sister White to C.W.C. White uh, in 1883. And we're going to see what she has to say. Uh, she's actually discussing or expounding on this text that I'm talking about now. And let's see what she has to say about it. We have a cunning devil to work against us. Christ alone is mighty and fully able to match his power. Therefore, we must have Jesus with us at every moment. Now, listen to the language she used. It actually surprised me a little. We are sleepy, stupid, and do not sense the arts and gins and snares of Satan set for unwary feet. Like the little turtle sunning himself on a little plank out in the water, thinking everything is lovely. We all too often get very comfortable and relaxed and we might find ourselves in that moment in a snare of the devil and we need to be ready. Therefore, we must know how we step, that every move is in God. 
Self must not come in here to make itself heard. The destruction of souls is the regular employment of Satan and his agents upon the earth. The salvation of souls is the work of every follower of Christ, however weak. When a man's selfish interest is made first and salvation of souls comes secondary, if at all, that man is working on Satan's side for his very pretensions are a snare to lead others off the track that they shall not consider the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. Now listen carefully. I'm going to read that again because this is talking not only about your own salvation, but whether or not you are working for the salvation of others, which is a very important thing, not just for me as a pastor. It's not just my job uh, to be working for the salvation of others. It is the job of every single Christian. If you call yourself a Christian, you fall under the same gospel commission that I do. Go and tell the world. Listen again as I read this one more time. When selfish interest is made first and the salvation of souls comes secondary, if at all, that man is working on Satan's side for his very pretensions are a snare to lead others off track, that they shall not consider the kingdom of God and his righteousness first. Satan is getting the start of all such workers. The salvation of souls comes first always, for Satan as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. We must snatch souls away from his path. We must have a clear foresight, discernment, and faith, and work as if to save a perishing life, if which of which some carelessness on our part might cause the death. So you hear that? We must work tirelessly, fearlessly, and yes, ferociously for the salvation of others. Because the devil is running about trying to devour everyone he can. And if we have the love of Jesus living in our hearts and shining through our lives, then we will work tirelessly for the salvation of others. In fact, my dad used to say, because he was an evangelist, you could show up in a church where there had been some infighting going on. And we know this happens in some churches from time to time. And you could show up there to do evangelism. And as soon as everyone in that church got focused on saving others' souls, they themselves changed. Uh, the issues and the things they were fighting about fell away and pretty soon they couldn't even remember why they were mad at each other. Why? Because they were finally doing what God has asked them to do. If you're distracted today with the things of this world, get busy with trying to save somebody's soul. All we can do is give the information and pray for the Holy Spirit to convict. But if we are not there to share the information, who will? That soul might be lost because you and I, you or I, we're not careful, but careless in our duty. And in doing so, we're being careless with our own salvation. Missionary work, God help us to understand what it is and how we must engage in it. Every missionary should be wholly the Lord's pressing, the wholly the Lord's. We must in, uh, engage in it. Every missionary must be holy, the Lord's pressing forward to attain to the perfection of Christ's character. The standard of piety must be lifted high. Every species of idolatry must be sacrificed. Souls, precious souls must be saved. Our every aim, our every goal must be to live the Christian life, to raise the standard high, and to be focused on the salvation of others. That's why we exist. That's why we're Christians. Jesus came to this earth not for his own enjoyment, his own pleasure, his own amusement. He came here with the express job of saving humanity. He is our perfect example. So your and my job is to save every soul we can by the grace of God, by his help, through his Holy Spirit. One man, when the church in Scotland was making some resolutions to compromise the faith, to concede their staunch principles, was determined never to yield a jot or tittle. He went upon his knees before God and pleaded, Give me Scotland or I die. His important prayer was, his importunate prayer was heard. Oh, that the dearest earnest prayer of faith arise everywhere. Give me souls buried now 
in the rubbish of error, or I die. Bring them to the knowledge of truth as it is in Jesus. You remember when Moses, when God was going to blot the people out, he said, Lord, if you're going to blot these people out, then you need to remove my name as well. Will you and I care so much for the salvation of others that we would rather die than lose a soul that could be gained by our testimony and our witness? That's where we need to be. If we're not there yet, we can't get there on our own. Don't feel bad about it. Start getting on your knees morning, noon, and night and asking the Lord to give you a love for the dying world, give you a love for the lost, uh, to give you a love for sharing Jesus. We should be so excited about Jesus that it's the only thing we want to talk about. If you don't feel that excited about Jesus, I encourage you once again, be in God's word morning, noon, and night. Wake up earlier, go to bed later, stop watching TV earlier in the evening, spend more time in God's word. I implore you by the grace and mercy of God to find yourselves worthy by studying his word, worthy of being approved of him, and worthy to share him with those who need him. We must carry the burden of souls upon our hearts. Every selfish consideration must give way to this. The cost of the blood of Christ shows the value of the soul. You see, brothers and sisters, the cost of the value of that neighbor of yours that's causing you trouble is the blood of Jesus. The cost of that person at the gas station who you could have said hello to, how are you doing, is your day going okay? The cost of their soul is the blood of Jesus. The cost of your soul, the cost of my soul is the blood of Jesus. In and of myself, I am worth nothing. But because of Jesus, there is value in me, not because of who I am, but it is Christ in me and Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, I want to read a couple more verses before we stop here. You remember I read in the beginning, 1 Peter 5, verse 8. I'd like to read a few more now. Listen to what it says. I'm going to start with 8 again, but I'm going to read on a little bit because I want to leave you with this little kind of benediction here. But be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him, steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same sufferings are experienced by your brotherhood, in the world. You're not alone. Others are experiencing the same things you are. Be encouraged. Be steadfast in the faith. How do we build faith? By spending time in God's word like we're doing right now. But may the grace, the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord, if we can be perfected, we will give you the glory and the honor for that. And Lord, we will use that life that you have given us to share your truth with a world in need. Lord, show us that our very salvation is dependent upon our witness and our testimony and our love for lost souls. Lord, fill us with an urgency. Fill us with a love for a dying world. Fill us with a testimony so that we can go out and we're excited to tell others what we have seen and what we have heard. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, folks, blessings and have a wonderful rest of your evening.